Discover over 100 episodes of Bartholomew Town on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. We treat some people like they're disposable. We treat some neighborhoods like they're disposable. And we treat other neighborhoods like they're not. Right now, Rhode Island politics discounts the progressive message, right? We don't really have a space for it. Welcome in to another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Bartholomew. On today's episode, I sit down with the person behind Uprise RI, Steve Alquist. And Steve Alquist, one of the people at the forefront of independent journalism here in Southern New England, no doubt about it, the founder of Uprise Rhode Island, a decidedly progressive news outlet, which is something that Steve and I discuss in this episode, a conscious choice to be biased. But even with that bias in place and often covering what you might describe as progressive issues, Uprise, nonetheless, a go-to news outlet for politicos of all stripes and anyone who's just trying to figure out what's going on in their neighborhood here in Rhode Island. So stick around, coming right up, one-on-one with Steve Alquist from The Loft. Support for the Bartholomew Town podcast comes from PDQ Graphics of Newport. Now, they're a full-service commercial printing company and graphic design studio, and they've been printing large and small-scale projects in Rhode Island for decades. In fact, they're going to be celebrating their 40th anniversary next year. So go ahead, check out their website. It's PDQRI. Com. And a great way that you can support the pod is to subscribe, rate, and review on your preferred pod app. All right, without further ado, my conversation with Steve Alquist. A superhero journalist, uh-huh. now uh, profiled on the national level, and someone who is daily reading for me and for many politicos in the state. I think you reach probably as many people who have progressive politics as non-progressive politics whether or not they want to admit it or not mm-hmm. you know just like i I'm, you know i'm sure a lot of people read uh, the ocean state current or whatever it is sure. on, on the left but you have a very specific brand um and you've become a, arguably the most trusted news source to many political political um and social issue followers in the state well so, thanks well what is it like to walk in those shoes you know as an oh. independent journalist um well it's uh, you know it's a sense of responsibility right i mean you really don't want to mess it up I might almost use another word there, but you don't want to mess it up. You want to make it, uh, right? You, well, you want to, there's a certain obligation you have after a while to people to show up for things that sometimes when you can't show up because you're one person, you can't just assign a person in your place, right? Um, you feel a little guilt, right? Like um, there's groups out there, there's stories I haven't done that I wish I had done and or stories I could be doing right now that get pushed aside for other things that seem more immediate. And I'm making these judgment calls on the fly, but to the people who I'm letting down, it can be a little bit different. My choices aren't always what they would have made, right? Right. And unfortunately, you know, you you can't be up for 24 hours. You're a one-person operation. Exactly. Although you have support, you have, um, it it seems like a core base of people who are are, are there to rally for you. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, you're the video editor, you're the assignment you're assigning where you're going to go, how you're yeah. going to cover it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's tough to um, – that's a tough world to exist in, to have to make those decisions for yourself. It is, and it, and it means that you're prioritizing, but you're trying to prioritize in a way that helps people who are more marginalized and not. So if you have a choice between covering an event for a group like DARE or PRISM or going to a press conference for the governor, it's really obvious that I'm going to be at the DARE or PRISM event. Also, because the rest of the media in Rhode Island is going to be at the governor's. So she's got the access to the media. She's got the access to the message. You know, she can do that. People who don't have that are where I'm trying to fill in the gaps. Right, especially in the context of the the shifting media uh, landscape. So Mm -hmm. many less reporters, so many less um, stories are told on a daily basis by the traditional media outlets. So. It allows for uh, someone to come in like you, for you to come in and fill that void at the same time. It's a, it's a different task than collecting a – not that – you know that's a rude way to put it, but collecting a paycheck from a, right. a traditional media outlet is a lot different than a straight-up artist approach to this. That's <laughs> true, and that's, that's an interesting – you said artist because I think of journalism as an art form more than as a uh, craft – well, I guess there's a craft to it, but more than just as a job. It's an art. Right there's yeah. not there's not a science to journalism, I think. I think you have to make decisions on the fly, on the fly, and there's uh, 
some of those decisions aren't cut and dry. There's no book you go to and say, if A, then B. It's right. what do I feel is right here? This is the way it needs to go. And it's, sometimes it's just following an emotional current. Yeah, and understanding the human condition, understanding the environment that we're in, and right. all those intangibles, those those come into play in great journalists. I also agree it's an art form. You think of you know, the great broadcasters, the great writers, mm-hmm. videographers, radio personalities, whatever it is. To me, they're in a similar context to more of a fine artist or um, you know, the storytelling tradition right. rather than the, more on the academic side where, I don't know, it just comes from a slightly different place. Well, there's a way to do a story where you don't know anything about the story. And you show up at the site and you say, okay, who's holding a sign saying yes? Who's holding a sign saying no? I'll get an interview with both of them. I'll put them in opposition in my video or my writing, and then I've got the balance enough stories all set. But it doesn't really make sense if you think about the truth of the world, the reality of the world, right? So the guy saying yes to, I don't know, some stupid thing like murder, and somebody saying no to murder, and then you class them as if they're equal. Does that really make sense? I mean, have you, you haven't put any judgment into it. You haven't put any thought into the macro issue. You haven't thought about the truth. Is one guy a liar and one guy a truth teller? So you really need to know something about the subject, and you need to understand what people are bringing to it, what the motivations are for being there. And if you get there, I think now you're closer to something like truth, and you're closer to what I would think of as real balance and real objectivity. Even, and then you, know, you also have to kind of own your biases, as I right. like to say. right? You know, everybody's biased, but you want to bring – you want to be open about them. Mm, yeah, and that's something that Uprise certainly is. You know, mm-hmm. like it's not – trying to disguise itself as right. you know d- right down the middle in terms of coverage or opinion. No, that whole fair and balanced like the old Fox <laughs> logo, you know, we don't do that cuz yeah. I don't really be- I've never believed it in my life. I always thought people have some sort of they're carrying something with them. Even if they're carrying this idea of journalism as a beacon of truth inside them, then they're serving journalism maybe more than they're serving the story, the people truth right you know if you're defending journalism above all then there's also a issue there i'm not sure maybe i'm defending truth above all and maybe that's a problem too and or or at least people is what i really try to serve right what the interests of people are that's really difficult to know and it's a lot of uh weight to carry i think like yeah good yeah I, I'm, I'm with you there it's, yeah. it's heavy and it, cre- it enters into spaces that you can't put your you know your finger on it someone told me one time for I don't remember who it was, but they said, you know, for everything we can understand, for there, 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 there's got to be a duality to that. There's got to be a, a, something to balance out that we can't comprehend as mm-hmm. human beings, you oh, know. Yeah. And I feel like journalism, to me anyway, it's, it, it's proven as an art form because it enters so often into that space of things we can't understand. Why are there – we were at that Trump rally together. Oh, yeah. Why are people responding to some of these statements the way they are? I can't really wrap my head around that. So – you know, you got to go into this intangible place to tell that story. Yeah, it, it's, you know, and you don't want to like, um, it, it's, it would be easy to go to a Trump rally from my position and say, well, they're just coming from a place of fear or mm-hmm. ignorance. And I don't want to believe that, right? Right. So I don't want to just like quickly diagnose them with some quick Freudian thing or something and say, oh, this is what their problem is, right? He feels smaller in the world or something. I really want to kind of del- peel it back. I think... I know who, what I think. I would, ostens- I would say ostensibly some people I know who are into Trump are good people. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to reduce their reactions to nothing but fear or nothing but racism. I want to see is there something more there. You know? And sometimes it comes down to just this basic sense of fairness and they don't feel they've been treated fairly or something like that. But that's not fear. That's something else, right? That's something like there's a, like a justice component to, it, to the way they're thinking. And whether I believe they're right or wrong, you know, you want to be at least respectful of them. But then there are some people who you don't want to be respectful of. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Some people who are really just kind of sowing this for negative reasons. And I don't know if I should drop names, but I think like John DiPietro, for instance, is a person who um, sows that kind of uh, deep division because it's good for his ratings, it's good for his brand, and he doesn't care. And I think that's really too bad because... Anyway, uh, I will, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, it's uh, all to do bad because mechanically speaking, to Petro is a, a really talented radio host. You know, he's, right. he, I was drawn into, in a lot of ways, I was pulled back into politics when I moved back to Rhode Island by DePetro. Yeah. Because I discovered 630 on the dial and I was flipping through, rediscovered it. I was like, oh, yeah, this is oh, cool. 
who's this? Oh yeah, DePietro, I remember him. And all of a sudden I started to call the station and it created this this situation where I was pulled back in to respond to him. Yeah. So I almost credit him at a certain level with, you know, kind of moving things in a way that it probably agitated enough people to respond at, at some level. Yep. At the same time, like you say, um, you know, I do I'll listen to the show on Facebook or whatever sometimes and be like, right. why is he going here? What's what are you right. doing, man? This is yeah. crazy. Well, I don't I mean, that's the thing. I don't know if he's I don't I don't want to say dishonest, but it doesn't feel honest to me. Right. Sometimes, right? I don't know I never come away from a DePetro show thinking I know what he really thinks. Yeah. I think, you know, I mean, I don't know what he really thinks. I think mm-hmm. in general it might be just a little bit crass, but I don't know that and I don't want to put that on him, but I don't I know we don't get along and in We've hit each other back and forth, and if he listens to this, I'm sure he'll be saying some nasty yeah, things see. about me. <laughs> <laughs> Coming out of wound socket there, you'll hear yeah. uh, over the transmitters. Let's get into your origins. <laughs> sure. Um, I know you were involved with R.I. Future back in the day, yep. and, and and again, I was in, I was out of state for th- that period, if you will. I was going yeah. from 06 through, through 16, traveling back and forth, yeah. but not fully immersed. But I know that you were one of the first people I discovered oh, nice. post-Trump. Oh, oh wow. all right. You know, here we go. Here, yeah. the, 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 there is a drumbeat in Rhode Island against this um, this sentiment in, in terms of a, a media presence, mm-hmm. and a very specific media presence. And and I just started following you right away. At the same time, I discovered Nisi and McGowan, all the all the, Ian Donis. Yeah. And I, I was like, wow, this is great because I don't even remember this being in New York having, you know, the dedicated progressive right opinion slash news website. Yeah. Well. It was obviously not there. I we I was lucky because I started a few years before Trump was in office, and I was still carrying that progressive banner, if you will, and I was talking about issues from the point of view of people on the ground that the Democratic majority in this state have been ignoring, right? Um, immigration issues um, were a big deal. Um, women's rights issues, human rights issues, just um, the way the state house comports itself and runs business. I would be critical of that. It was, there's always a story. And then there's the way that state house handles that issue. That is another story in itself, right? You could always write about a, um, let's say they're hearing a gun bill and you could write about how the gun bill, you write about the gun bills and the different opinions, but you could also write about how does the state house react to the various people bringing these issues forward for women's rights issues. You know, here they are saying we want to protect Roe v. Wade. How does our state house respond? Not pretty, not very well. I mean, they had. I mean, that was like a, yeah, that was like a battlefield, like World War One, right? In trench warfare. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yep. taking inches at a time, and uh, and that, and they did not make it easy. I mean, these are things that you know the majority of Rhode Island wants they can't get. Why is that? What's keeping us back? And so when you look at that and you start looking at the lobbyist situation and the money and all that stuff, it can be eye opening and re- 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 revelatory. But uh. I was started. I started years before Trump came into office, and before Trump was even thought a possibility. I think if we mm-hmm. went back to three years before Trump, and you said you wrote a newspaper and said, "Here's the world," they'd people that's ridiculous. It's science fiction. It doesn't make any sense. It's like Kurt Vonnegut novel, right? Yeah. Have you ever read Slapstick? Sure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It feels like slapstick real, <laughs> made real, right? And uh, no one would yeah. believe, and no one thought. Everybody thought slapstick was a little bit too much. You know, that book came out, and it, the reviews were like, "This is a little bit too silly, a little bit too." Weird, but if you said the president's going to tweet policy, you're right. Right. No one's going to believe that. It's, this sounds insane. Or even Donald Trump going to be president sounds crazy, right? Funny, right. but um, it's almost more believable if you told me Rush Limbaugh somehow. Would something have won, like that, right? You know, it, some... Almost, right? I mean, it is hard. I mean, I've read a lot of you know books over my years, and some people, you know, there's been alternate universe things where Al Capone becomes president, and that seems more realistic. Yeah, right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> you know, like something, or like, yeah. you know, Jimmy Hoffa or something becomes president. I mean, these things are yeah. seem possible, but that didn't. And uh, so, but what happened was, because I had been working in the trenches a little bit before that, I think I could, I could write about Trump more authoritatively because I didn't just come to these views suddenly. You know, I wasn't like, oh, wait, Trump's terrible. Let's do this. It's like, no, I've been working on these issues for a while. So when I say Trump's terrible, I'm not lying. And I was critical of things that happened under Obama, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I didn't, I've never had a problem saying, you know, uh, Obamacare didn't go far enough. You know, Obamacare did help save my wife's life, right? I mean, she had stage four cancer, and Obamacare came right at the perfect time for us wow. to not lose our house. 
you know, while we were trying to, I mean, yeah, we had a house that was completely paid for. We were, you know, that's why I could afford to do this in a sense because yeah. we weren't in deep debt. We had a no mortgage. I could take less money and work in this field. But uh, then uh, she was diagnosed as having cancer. That was really, really tough. So here I am trying to like do this new career and my wife's in chemo every two weeks for a while and there's operations and stuff. And that made it really difficult uh, to do. But when I was out there in the world doing this work, I met people who were supportive of me too, right? When I was going to Barville, I met cancer survivors there who understood where my wife was. So it became, you know, when people say you're entrenched, <laughs> right? You become like emotionally entrenched as well. You become attached to certain people and it's, I don't know. So there you lose your objectivity maybe too. Absolutely. I yeah, know. experience is going to shape it no matter right. what. So. Right, and you want to yeah, – I'm probably rambling a little bit. This so. is great. No. Oh, okay, good. All right, <laughs> all right. As far as today where, where Uprise is, you have contributors. Sometimes you see like an Andy Boardman or um, yeah. uh, Lauren Nidell Gresh get sure. involved or whatever yeah. it is. But you're, you're the primary driver. Yeah. You're a videographer. You're a writer. Mm -hmm. Just a multimedia journalist. In terms of where you go from here, is it more about courting – average everyday Rhode Islanders going out and trying to get expand the base in terms of numbers or is it more about serving the existing base is that or does that not even really matter no you know when I think about what I want to do with it to expand it or to where I want to bring it in the future I always think to myself well I'm stuck with what I have as far as resources right yep and so I'd love to be able to pay contributors I'd love to be able to hire someone to partner with me. And I, and when I say hire, I mean bring them in and say, work with me. Let's do this. But uh, I really can't promise anybody that they'll make any money, right? I yeah. can't. <laughs> so I don't want to say, please join me and accept this like vow of poverty. I'll still be living in my nice little house yeah. <laughs> and I'll be still doing this. But whoever joins me would have to have their own economic situation set up or yeah. I'd have to find a way to finance it to do that. And right. I've thought about ways to do that, but it's there. The, the time I would take to do that pulls me away from doing the work. I know that's the struggle. It's like right? as you build an independent thing, you know, even just like you say, sales or whatever, anything right. just to get the dollars moving, just to keep it afloat is yeah. is it's a full time job. It literally is a full time job at other media outlets for multiple people. So, sure. I mean, if I wrote a uh, uh, what do you call those things to get money, right? A grant. Yes. Oh, and I God, brought it to the Rhode it, yeah. Island Foundation, yeah, right? Yeah. So now I'm going to work on a grant. That's going to take me weeks, yeah. right, of time I'm not doing the work. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to present it to the Rhode Island Foundation. Again, days and hours of time I'm not doing the work. If something, if some, the Rhode Island Foundation is for anybody else said, come in here and uh, present to us about your idea. We might be interested. And a big story comes up, right? I'm going to be at this story. <laughs> Yep. I'm going to say, oh, sorry, I can't make it. I have to cover this stupid story. Yep. And they're, and they're going to like, well, what, what, how much do you want this? And I'm like, honestly, I want it less than I want to do the job. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't do that work. I mean, I'm happy when people find me and I love it when people send me money. And, but, and because it helps me do what I do, right? I mean, my camera breaks. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> right. and then it costs me $300 to fix it or $700 to replace it. That's just the reality of the world. And I don't have three to $700 laying around to fix a camera anytime it breaks. And I, and I have now have two cameras, but you know, if one breaks, I'm down to one until I get the other one fixed or something. So it's kind of, it's hard. And that's all I'll say is you make choices and the choice I'm making is to just work on the site overall. Yep. That's what I want to do. I bet that's relieving that you've made that choice because I, I can say even just to the listeners out there now that it's I'm riddled with anxiety about how to proceed, mm. you know, where to put time, how to how to get it so it can, you know, at least generate enough income to support itself, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, why am I even thinking about this? Go out to the, the next story. Mm -hmm. Just keep moving. Right. Um, you know, it's 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 nice that you're in that that headspace because it's reflected in the website you know the, the the fact that your website is so thorough and so well done i'm sure is a, a major contributor to that as you're not spending time hounding people for ads or this that or the other no I, and like i think about that like last uh, election season i thought would have been a good time you know when i first started out i was with rhode island future and then about two years ago i started uprise rhode island because you know different things happened yep. and uh so when i'm Going into election season, I thought, oh, this would be a great time to reach out to some of those candidates and say, hey, you know, it would help me out, and it might help you out to put an ad up 
you know, I'd sell a banner ad. I'd work something out. I never really did that. I never reached. I think I may have sent an email once to somebody, like maybe to the working families party or something, saying, hey, if you have any candidates who want to do some advertising, let me know. But uh, there's a, you know, I think from their point of view, they saw it as like a charity to me, right? Because the people who are really into my site are probably going to vote for a working families party candidate. Right, right, right. right. And if, you, um, but if you're, uh, if you're Dan McKee, you're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to be on Steve Alkos' website. And if you're Aaron Regenberg, it's like, well, all those people are going to vote for me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right. So what does yep. that buy you? And I understand that. And I, but I also did, but I didn't push it hard. I didn't say, hey, this would be really helpful. You know, I didn't say this would be great. So this would be an appeal for both of us. Right. You know, big candidate, send us some money or something. Yeah, exactly. You know? All of a sudden you get Bob Flanders sending you ads or whatever, you know. <laughs> well, that, and there's, a, there's another side, right? Because uh, recently um, I've been doing some of the Google ad stuff on there. Yes. You know, I yep. have somebody help me with that. And, you know, you have to go through um, advertiser by advertiser. You And, like, so you want to kick off, like, you want to kick NRA ads off. Right. right. Yeah. And so he's like, okay, I don't want the NRA advertising on my site. All right. But, and I have no problem. Lululemon, I don't know much about it, but you know, they want to advertise. That's great. But you have to go through and individually knock off every single advertiser. So, so if it's, um, Bob Flanders, you have to say Bob Flanders, but if it's Trump, you have to say Trump, you have to knock them off individually. If it's the, I don't know. So you have these like kind of weird groups you don't want to necessarily have on your site. You have to, if they overlap or if they're similar, well, the, each and every individual person has to be knocked off. So if you yep. bought an ad on behalf of something, an issue, and I didn't like it, I'd have to knock you off. I'd have to knock, you know, it's very hard. Interesting, It's yeah. time-consuming. And so every once in a while I get things like, hey, Steve, did you know that they're selling, like, guns on your site? I'm like, no, I didn't know. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll figure that out. Last five minutes or so, oh, okay. um, let's, let's talk about Rhode Island today. Yeah. You know, there's this big push now. On the one hand, to and I don't even know if there's this big push. I might just be making that up. It just yeah. seems like there's a push to go forward with the, you know, you got the innovation hub at the Wexford building. Yeah. You've got the new pedestrian bridge and Plant City, and the, maybe mm-hmm. the Fane Tower is going to come in. And there's the, you know, this whole version of Providence. Meanwhile, here we are in Elmwood, where you know there's really it's almost, you know, infrastructurally um, night and day compared to what's going on up totally there. Totally true. How do we create an equitable society here? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's obviously we could do a, we could do a podcast series Absolutely. every day for the rest of our lives on that topic. But yep. in terms of just out of the gate, looking at zoning, opportunity zones, looking at education, mm-hmm. just the, the very basics of, of what we're building here. Right. What are some steps from your vantage point that we could take to, to pull it back to just a little bit closer to equitable? Well, that's a big, that's a big thing. Um, you know, when we think about uh, what they're trying to do in Providence right now in Ward 10, they want to put in this uh, new zone for nightclubs, yes. right? They want to move all the nightclubs into Ward 10, which is where we also move all the chemical facilities. And there are people who live in the Washington Park, South Side area, who will then have to deal with all the traffic and all the violence that comes with nightclubs. Not that nightclubs are inherently violent, but we know in Rhode Island there have been some unfortunate incidences, sure. right? A 19-year-old woman shot just recently, not too far from yeah, here. In right? War 10. In War 10, right? Um, and they want to move all the nightclubs there. They want to move all the junk there. And because, and I think that tells the people there what are you're worth. And when you talk about what's equitable, are these people worth anything? I mean, imagine if they tried to say, let's build that on the east side. Right. Right. Or as they said, let's put that all on Block Island. Yeah. <laughs> right. Never happened. There's exactly. just no way. James, you know, there's places we could not, we'd never conceive of doing this. We treat some people like they're disposable. We treat some neighborhoods like they're disposable, and we treat other neighborhoods like they're not. As far as these investment zones or what the uh, opportunity, opportunity zones, zones yeah. that's a a Trump tax cut policy that was adapted immediately by our anti-Trump Democratic local governments, right? So they put in, they made their own, they basically took that and they immediately said, "Oh, this we're anti-Trump." But we love this idea of giving millionaires huge tax breaks when they invest in certain areas. And we have opened up those opportunity zones to allow for people to maybe not really invest the way that would be most beneficial to people within those zones. Right? We never institute powerful clawbacks. We never enforce the laws that say if you're going to get a tax break from the city of Providence, you're going to, we're going to have a 
uh, minority and woman-owned businesses have to get first right of refusal to certain contracts. We never say pay a fair wage to the people who are working. You know, we're going to build a fame tower, but we're going to – and all those um, people building the tower will get paid decent money for sure. But the people who work that tower, I think there's going to be like four or five permanent employees, and we're not going to say pay them you know, living wages. We're going to say minimum wage applies, right? Um, so we don't do those things. So, we, you know, if we're going to give somebody like Fain, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of tax breaks and money, why don't we say also pay people in Rhode Island a livable wage? We weren't doing that for the uh, stadium when the stadium was being considered, right? Yeah. Hall Sox were going to stay here. They were going to have something like, I forget how many part-time jobs, and they were not going to pay minimum wage, and that was not even on the table. That wasn't even brought up much most of the time. But the building trades were all for building that, which I understand. But why aren't they also saying, but we also want to help protect other workers and the interests of people who will come after this. So when we're giving that stuff away, we should be demanding higher. Uh, we should be demanding more for our own people. Mm, yeah, more uh, return on the Rhode Island sure, people. Right. And, and the Rhode Island people. I think, I think that's what we need, right? right. I mean, because like Fain is going to come away from this and, you know, I don't even know. I mean... I see him, he's super old, and even his daughter is really old. And they're, I mean, they're not going to be around forever. By the time this building is fully operational and going and, you know, it's been here for 10 years, Fane will be a distant memory, and whoever owns it then will be some new person, like much like the mall, right? We put that mall in, and they sold it, and they sold the tax breaks along with it. And I'm not sure, but I f- have a feeling that Fane, once he's given all these tax breaks, he could sell this entire project to another developer. Another developer comes in and builds it with all these tax breaks attached. Um, I don't know what that does for Rhode Island. I don't. I mean, I'm all for building stuff, but I'd like to see smart investment, smart building. Um, I don't think we should be building a tunnel <laughs> in Kennedy Plaza, <laughs> right? Right. Um, there's all these dumb ideas that come along, and then all these people with power and money come along and say, "Yeah, we're all for it," and then the people in the on the ground are saying, "Wait a minute." You know, we're building this new bus terminal. We're taking the bus terminal, breaking it up into three areas. Now, instead of crossing a street to get to my next bus, I have to walk or take a third bus to the judiciary center or to the state house or something to get to my third bus. Um, if you're disabled or you know you're sight impaired, now you've got an extra whole. I mean, how do you navigate across the city? And think about in the snow when we're not plowing the sidewalks and stuff, right? It's just gonna it's just gonna hurt people. And I think it's really interesting that people who never take the bus say this is a great idea, and people who take the bus are saying no, don't do this to us. So these are the ways we need to be thinking if we really want to move forward on these projects. And these are the way we need to be thinking if we want to think about how do we make it more equitable in this state. We need to think in terms of equity. We need to think in terms of who's being affected. And how does this work for the people? How does this work for us? Because the rich are going to be fine. You know, when this, when whatever crises hits us, they're all going to be able to like move to the next town and we're all going to be stuck here dealing with whatever monster party they threw for us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be awful. That was a terrible metaphor, but we'll I like stick it though. It. All right. <laughs> the yeah. Rhode Island political co-op on the scene now, oh, yeah. uh, they were, we had a round table, little air, well, it's going to air before this episode. So nice. listeners will have heard this, uh, the roundtable, by the time they hear this episode with you. The notion of a statewide effort to elect progressive candidates, or any candidates for that matter, right. whether Sue Sienke put together some, you know, the same thing on the right, mm-hmm. is that something that can work here in Rhode Island when you think about the regional differences between, I don't know, you know, Ashaway and East Greenwich and the east side of Providence? Can you put together a statewide message and expect to have results in these primaries? Um, I, I, I'm not sure about what their ultimate plans are. I mean, I've talked to them a little bit, but I, I don't know what their ultimate core plan is. But I think there are regional differences, and I think a, a candidate running um, in Providence has a better opportunity or an easier path to victory that I can see than a person running even in Warwick or Barville or wherever else they yeah. want to run, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, there are regional differences. But I think the message as a whole, I think we showed last election with a bunch of progressive being elected, right? Eight to 12, something mm-hmm. in that number, right? And this, the idea is to reduplicate that maybe a little stronger 
maybe bring it more. And I, you know, right now, Rhode Island politics discounts the progressive message, right? We don't really have a space for it. I mean, we when we do get victories or we do have things we want, let, well, you know, look at marriage equality. I'm not married to equality. I'm sorry. Um, uh, abortion rights, right? What was won there? We they fought tooth and nail, and they got status quo under the law. Everybody on both sides said nothing's going to change. We passed this law, and and it, or not passed this law. Nothing changes unless the Supreme Court comes down and does it right. But the, until the Supreme Court does, it's all the same. So we they literally threw everything they had into a fight to maintain the status quo. We didn't advance the progressive cause at all by passing that law, right? We did not get any extra stuff. So think about what that cost the progressive movement in terms of activism, money, power, people, time. Um, that shows that the progressive movement has a lot of room to grow and to assert themselves and so to the extent that they're trying to um, put more progressives in to advance these kind of ideas i think it's fine um i think it's interesting that bill lynch reacted so how would i say unhinged against it right i mean this is just basically a group of people getting together saying we're going to have a common message we're going to have common uh, uh tools Right, we're gonna, you know, to bring this forward. Right, we're gonna, and we're gonna like work together to advance this message. And he came at him and like they were committing these like terrible, terrible like um, crimes. I I don't see where the crimes are yet. Maybe there are, but I don't see why something like this can't happen. Like, right, you know, if there's like some kind of tweak to the way they're doing things to make it work so that Bill Lynch is happy, that's fine. But these unhinged accusations that this is like some kind of deep, terrible plot is a little weird. And I think it shows that people are afraid a little bit of this message taking hold and upsetting the way business is done at the House, at the Senate, in the executive branch. You know, they don't want to be held to that accountability. They don't want to have to justify why certain lobbyists get more time behind closed doors than other lobbyists do. Why women, in fact. I mean, remember last season the Senate put up a gate in front of the door and would not let a lobbyist on the floor of the Senate before. But some lobbyists walked in anyway. If you were a man wearing a suit, you just walked right by the guy. But if you were women advocating for uh, justice reform, that you know, and I know the two women, they were having a hard time getting in. They couldn't. They were stopped. They First of all, they were respecting the rules. But then they're seeing other people walk in ahead of them, other leg- lobbyists walking in. And they're like, why is that man walking in? This is these are the ways power is played. I have this picture I took years ago of uh, the lobbyist for the Catholic Church sitting in an office that was open with his feet up on the desk, looking out at me, kind of shocked because I took his picture <laughs> in this kind of way. Right? Why was he able to just sit inside an empty office or even a full office, just as if he owned a place? Well, it's because he owns the place and. That's the power he was given. He can open up those doors that you or I would just be stopped by this, you know, Capitol Police and (laughs) said, you can't go in there. (laughs) Right. Go stand downstairs. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Right. You wait your turn. Yeah. Steve Alquist, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Uprise RI is the website. You can find it on social media. Of course, the website itself, YouTube, and pretty much any event in Rhode Island, you're bound to find Mr. Steve Alquist out there. Thank you. This was great. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad I finally got to be here. It's always a great pleasure to spend some time together here on the pod. And I'll be back on Tuesday with a brand new episode. Remember, there's over 130 episodes backlogged for you on your preferred podcast app, ripodcast.com or bartholomewtown.com. Have a great weekend. And until next time, I'm Bill Bartholomew. We'll talk soon. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com employers.